I am telling you, it is the definition between an entrepreneur and an employee. An employee goes to the cliff, looks over the cliff, says, is there a balloon down there to catch me? Will I be safe? What happens if it hurts? What if I land on my neck? The entrepreneur, they said, we need you to jump off the cliff, backs up 10 feet to get a fucking run. The energy of comics has never had a revolution. If you weren't there, you just don't get idea. These guys were rock stars. These guys were Elvis, all of them. It was like seven Elvises. There were riot police. There were helicopters in the air. This is for a comic book store signing. I've never seen comic creators generate that kind of excitement, and I don't believe I will again. I, I do not believe it's possible. The industry of comics has never had a revolution. When Image hit, it was a perfect time and a perfect place, which I personally don't believe is ever going to happen again. I didn't buy my first comic book till I was about 15 and just got addicted literally that day. Went back the next day, bought some more, the next day bought some more. Most wannabe artists start doing Superman and Batman and all these characters. In the midst of doing their characters, I also invented a bunch of them. But the one that was always my favorite was this character called Spawn. For years, I sent off samples. I went to conventions uh, as I tried to break in and get a job. After literally about 300 rejections, and I come walking up to the trailer I was living in, and my wife throws the door open and says, hey, Todd, who's Steve Englehart? And I go, he's a comic book writer. He just phoned and offered you a job. I'd been sending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds at this point. In the late 80s, Todd McFarlane rose to superstardom very quickly. It's very artistic and edgy. Todd was huge. Spider-Man was floundering. And then Todd came on with a jolt. And I started getting into a groove, started winning a lot of awards. People were sort of digging what I was doing. Well, Todd McFarlane is not only one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet, but he's a terrific artist with a style all his own. He's also a great businessman. Usually the two don't go together. Todd McFarlane is a pretty outspoken guy, and he made no bones about the idea that he wasn't crazy about some of the scripts that he was getting. And then he decided that he wanted to write comics himself, so they created a brand new Spider-Man title just called Spider-Man for him. I thought it was sort of foolish of them to give a new Spider-Man title to a guy who'd never written a book, but I wasn't about to argue with him. But then we got out of the gates and set sales records with that issue number one. At the point that came out, that was the best-selling first issue of a comic of all time. At that time, there were four Spider-Man books, but only Todd McFarlane's was selling in the millions. I can't remember a time when I wasn't reading a comic or trying to create a comic. 
when I was in the fifth and sixth grade, art teacher would be like, you need to go paint a bowl of fruit. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to delve sequential art. I've never met a guy who loved drawing comics more than Rob. So right when I got out of high school, I was busting tables, uh, delivering pizzas, and working construction six days a week. In my after hours, I would do comic book pages, draw samples, draw samples, draw samples, and try and get into the business. I went to the very first WonderCon. I was nervous about getting in line. I had never had my portfolio reviewed before. So I hesitantly went up there, boom. DC Comics, they were kind of busy. They said they'd take my stuff home and look at it. But Marvel hired me on the spot. I, I was like, wow, this is awesome. The thing about Rob was he was always this just big ball of energy. Like a speed freak that stuck his finger in a light socket. He's kind of like the Michael Bay of, of comic books, maybe. Layout dynamics are the most important thing to me. It was always about how can I make this page more exciting? I do not want to be cookie cutter. I do not want to be plain. Liefeld had definitely tapped into the hyper masculinity that comic books had and had figured out that that was something that people would buy and be really, really into. Rob had just done X-Force. If you wanted new characters, if you wanted new ideas, you know, that was where you went. He had all these sketches. He was like, this is a new character I got, Deadpool. You think people will like him? These were all dropping out of my head onto the paper and people were eating them up. Five million copies later, you're sitting there going, holy moly, this is, this is crazy. And I've been in the business at that point for less than four years. This man, Jim Lee, illustrated the highest selling comic book of all time. He did X-Men number one, and Jim, I can't even sell him how many copies that book sold. Uh, I, I think we sold about 8.2 million copies. That, yeah. that was the latest count. 8.2 right. million copies of one comic book. Jim Lee was the whole package. He drew phenomenally. People would always tell me and talk, now you guys are good, but Jim draws correct. My earliest memories are, are, are drawing. Growing up in Korea, then we uh, immigrated to the United States when I was five. Didn't speak any English. You can read a story just looking at pictures, and I think that's what got me initially interested in comic books. There wasn't a lot to feed the imagination. You really had to create your own fantasy world, and I would do that, you know, uh, using a pencil and paper. And my father was a doctor. He wanted me to follow in his footsteps, and I had given myself this kind of one-year deadline to kind of get into comics. I, Pretended like I had the job already. I would literally wake up, roll out of bed, sit down and start drawing. And I would draw like eight to 12 hours a day to the point where I kind of pinched the nerve and my hands and knuckles started swelling up. Some of the stuff I, I first submitted, it was pretty crude and, and bad. Um, but every three or four months, there was progress. Jim kind of wowed me. You could see from month to month, issue to issue, he just kept getting better and better. It's like, slow down, dude. You're making this look bad. We came in, Todd, Jim Lee, myself, at a time when new energy was necessary. And I don't think those guys cared about getting the page done. It was like, what do I need to do to make this page look unbelievable? and powerful because they're, they're big fans themselves and they were all working on their dream job. We all were loud, splashy. We had things pop more. And our critics would say, all you guys do is pander to the lowest common denominator. Whatever, whatever we were doing, if we were pandering, it connected. It didn't look like anything on the shelf. There was stuff that looked like comic books and then their work looked like an action movie. All their books were selling out left and right, and any book they touched was just gold. So for the first time, comics really had celebrities. In the early 90s, Rob Liefeld was in the Levi's 501 commercial, directed by Spike Lee. So how long have you been drawing comic books? So I was about seven years old, little kid. What did your parents think about it? They hated it. They hated it. Oh, yeah. So where is this drawing on? This is the Spike Man. And what's this right here? This is the camera on top of your head that will record the wrongdoings of others. When I was growing up, Prince, Madonna, Michael Jackson, they grabbed a generation in the 80s. We did that in the 90s. We grabbed them. Rob, Todd, and Jim were becoming huge superstars in the industry. More artists with similar sensibilities soon joined them, including Eric Larson, who took over for Todd on Amazing Spider-Man. When I was very young, uh, 
I started writing and drawing my own comic books for my own entertainment. And so I've pretty much been writing and drawing comics since third or fourth grade. All of the guys who started Image, they all knew one another and they all had similar sensibilities. Uh, Todd McFarlane came up to me at San Diego Comic Con and goes, Hey, you're one of the L Boys, Lee Larson Leifeld. I gotta meet the L Boys. And he goes, I met Larson, I got Leifeld, all I gotta meet is Jim Lee. And we did everything with Todd. Todd's like, oh, So what have you been doing this, like uh, two years? I'm like, Yeah. And he goes, well, you're figuring out the fingers and the thumb. I'm drawing extra bricks on the side of the wall. And I'm drawing window panes and, and clouds and details. Well, you're figuring out the hands and the anatomy. And I just responded to all of it. Everything he was selling, I was buying. When I was doing the artwork, when I get into doing buildings or debris, I'd get on the phone and I'd dial up some of these guys. And you'd be talking to them about goofy stuff. That I talked to him probably every day to the point where he'd be like, oh, you call me more than my mom, bud. Rob looked up to Todd quite a bit. I think all the guys did. Like he was the big brother I never had. But our pages are actually 10 by 15, which is about the size of uh, Rob's ego. Yeah. Okay, and the other biggest question that I get is, did you pay for that haircut? <laughs> Unfortunately I did, yeah. That's brutal, buddy. Sorry about that. That's brutal. Todd and Eric were friends. Rob knew Todd and Eric. When we had first met Rob, he was still living at home. Todd and I were sitting there in our sleeping bags in, in Rob's room. It's like we're, we're teenagers or something. I talked to Eric Larson when I worked at Marvel once a week, Todd four times a week, Jim Lee once a week. The almighty phone. There was a camaraderie, a brotherhood, or a, a frat house that was created. My cousin was a big comic book collector, um, so that's, that was my exposure to comics when I was a kid. Go to my cousin's house, he had thousands, especially the creepy and eerie magazine stuff, like Vampirella. You know, that was like my porn. Like a lot of kids of my age. <laughs> You know, I'd paint something once in a while or draw a noodle like kids do. You know, I was just a little bit better than the other kids. I never really thought of being an illustrator for comics um, up until literally six months before I got the gig. Uh, I was like, wow, this is great. I get to work at home, draw comic books, and get paid. What an easy gig. Mark is the best illustrator of all of us, period, end of story. He draws rings around the rest of us in his sleep. He was bored with comics when I broke in. Just before Image started, I was contemplating getting out of comics and how, about, and how to do that. Even though I loved it, there was just nowhere to go. And it was pretty much just Marvel and DC were the only option. Marvel owns every single character that they publish. DC owns you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, the Justice League. As I knew going into it, if I created anything there, that it, it, was, it was going to be theirs. Marvel corporate at that time was profiting madly off of recycling their covers for t-shirts and posters. When you do a t-shirt based on our artwork, you think maybe we could get like one copy of the t-shirt, right? Forget money, that like, we were, I mean, we were, we were beyond that conversation. There was just no vocalization or show of appreciation. That's the thing with Todd. Todd would be like, where's my plaque? He'll give me his whole speech like, I sold two million copies for you, Marvel. I didn't even get a watch. I didn't get a plaque. My dad got a watch when he worked at the factory. For a nominal amount of work, for, for minimal effort, they could have kept all of us. It, it, didn't, it wouldn't have taken much. The bar was fairly low. For me as a creator, uh, and I think a lot of the image guys felt this way, it's like you were always kind of hamstrung. When people said, don't do that, don't break that panel border. Don't do that page layout. And I don't think you should be writing stories like that. And I think that, you know, you're making Spider-Man's costume too dark. And, you know, I think the eyes are getting too big. Comics artists started to really see Marvel Comics as a corporate entity. 
and there wasn't going to be as much sense of loyalty after that. You want an employee like Rob Liefeld. I gave till it hurt and my, I gave good. In my last Spider-Man comic book, we had this goofy thing about, it's never gonna pass a comics code. This is a, probably about the seventh time I'd had this conversation. And I kept asking the same conversation. Uh, what is in the comics code? And none of them could actually ever tell me clearly what was in the comics code. They just told me what they felt, they thought the comics code meant. And I just went, you fix it any way you see fit. I'm done, I'm done. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. culture at Marvel was changing. They didn't like how how popular it would become. I mean, it's, it's the easiest way. I can dance around it, but the bottom line was the sales were following Todd, Rob, and Jim, and the other guys. Kids my age were starting to understand that there were creators behind these books, and that that's what, a, a lot of what we were into. Midway through my X-Force run, I took a full page ad out, the Comic Book Buyer's Guide, which was the weekly comic book newspaper, announcing the arrival of the executioners. I was awakened at 6.30 in the morning. It was the editor-in-chief of Marvel. Do you want a lawsuit? Is that what you're looking at? I don't know what you're thinking of doing here, but you, what are you doing? What are you, do what are you doing? They asked me that 12 times. I'm like, uh, I just want to do my own thing. There's nothing sinister here. I just, I, I want to do my own thing. Not this thing, not this thing. If this call doesn't go well, legal is going to get involved. Are we clear? And if anything, that kind of emboldened Rob. And these guys really do think that if we went and did something, that, that it, it might be big. The thing that I have the least amount of patience for with anybody is bitching about something and doing nothing towards it. I hate my job. I got an easy answer. Quit. I hate my hair. Go get a haircut. I, I, why, I hate people calling me a drunk. Put down the fucking drink. Tell people all the time, you gotta know your window. I mean, there was all these different factions, but the bottom line was the window was open. Rob wanted to know what it would be like to put together a comic. Wouldn't it be cool to put together a comic on your own? And my wife and I started laughing because we'd been doing that for years. Jim was a different generation who had done indie comics. I started drawing when I was about two, and my father read comics in World War II. He saw that I was drawing in a comic book style, and he started feeding me comics, and that was it. And then I got into comics by doing small press and underground comics first. So the idea of leaving Marvel and doing a super independent, there was no hesitation on his part. Rob kept after Eric, Todd, and I pretty much all that summer. And somewhere along the line, they started talking about, well, what if we all did books together? Rob really wanted to test the waters and to see if the fans who were reading his stuff over at Marvel would follow him someplace else. If you're gonna go and do a book, Rob, and you're gonna do one, Eric, I'm about ready to go. Why don't we try and band together? They can replace you one at a time, but you leave in, 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 in mass, and all of a sudden there's an impact there. Rob says, whatever's going down is gonna go down in New York City this weekend. If you wanna be part of it, you have to be there. Todd and Rob were going to New York for an auction, and they were auctioning off the entirety of Spider-Man 1, X-Men number 1, and X-Force number 1. So we go to New York, and we're going to tell the, the editor of Marvel that we're going to quit. When they left, they knew it was the four of us. The four of us were the core. But while we were there, we just went, man, if we could get some more guys, it'd be awesome. Well, coincidentally, Jim Lee was in town. Yeah, these guys are great. Hey, 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 what's up? Hey. Jimmy Lee. Hey. Jim has to be the most even guy that I've ever met. You know, Rob had made a comment uh, once that he's like a guy running for election. Jim was always held to a different standard at Marvel, too. They liked him more. <laughs> That's a different standard. They could understand Todd McFarlane not playing by the rules. Jim had always seemed a little more like a company man. If a guy who you thought was completely happy was willing to leave, then maybe what you're doing, you need to reevaluate it. And so I had a conversation with Jim Lee. Jim was a hard sell 
you know, I enjoyed working at Marvel. I enjoyed working with the people and the characters and everything. But the idea of doing something completely different, that appealed to that side of myself that didn't necessarily want to do what other people um, sort of envisioned for myself. He thought about it and thought about it, and then all of a sudden he went, let's do it. He was buddies with Wolf's Fratasio. They were sharing a studio. It was I called my best friend, Scott Williams, and I go, Scott, should we do this? Scott goes, yeah, I think so. I wanted to go where the creative energy was at, at its highest, and the guys who were forming Image were the best guys doing comics at the time. I bump into Mark Silvestri, and I always admired his work, and I go, Mark, let me just pitch you something. Just hear me out, give me half an hour. He laid out the plans for Image. I just saw him work him in the corner of the bar the way Todd and he was a televangelist, man. He was not going to be denied. And I go, unfortunately, at the end of the sales pitch, you've got till tomorrow morning because we've got a 10 o'clock meeting and we need, we need to tell them who's on, who's on the list and who's not. And I mean, I could tell in his eyes he was uncertain because he had heard as well that we were a bunch of nut jobs. Because the pitch was very scary. Uh, Fortunately for me, I was in a place in my life where I wanted to take a chance. The next morning, he phoned us up and said, I'm in. And we all had our own reason. And for me, it was like, yeah, I just needed a new spark. And he jumps on board, and now we're seven deep. And I go, wow, that's way stronger than I thought. Every guy drawing an X-Men book is now in. The two guys drawing Spider-Man are in, and the biggest selling non-X-Men, non Spider-Man comic, Guardians of the Galaxy, we got seven. And just to put it in perspective, the, those seven of us, we actually produced 44 of the top 50 titles, sales-wise, of 10,000 books that had come out in all of comic books in that, during that year. You know, people had done independence, obviously, for years before Image existed, but they never really made the impact that we always knew a group of guys could make together. No one had really done that before. I learned early on, Image, at some point, was kind of like Todd punishing Marvel. We go into the office of, of the publisher at Marvel. And he's a slick uh, southern boy. Well, let me tell you, folks. What do you need? What do you need? What, what, why, why, why are you leaving Marvel? And Todd basically got the top. Bud, we don't get a plan. He went into the watch. And we just basically say, we're leaving. Here's our reason. We're not here to negotiate. The best part about it is behind us, the door is slightly ajar. And in a classic, I mean, it's, it's well, you see this in a movie. Suddenly, the editor-in-chief falls in the door, like stumbles on, on the floor. Oh, hey guys, hey, uh, hey. Oh, hey guys, how you doing? And then Terry's like, do you want to join us? And I'm like, this is awkward. And then we crossed the street, went over to DC Comic Book. They thought they hit the mother load. Jim Lee had never even stepped foot in, in DC. <gasps> they were like, oh my God, Todd, you're bringing Jim Lee. And we basically went, no, nah, we're not here to work for you either. We're just here to basically repeat what we just said across the street. Todd did all the talking, all the bombast, all the, and I think, and I, I don't remember Jim speaking at all. I don't remember me speaking at all. We were just like. And I have clear recollection that even in that meeting at DC, they go, well, why would you guys do that? Why don't you come and work for us at DC? Because we just did this new contract to help better the rights and, and working conditions for the creative community. And I only had one question when they did it. While you put that contract together, did you consult a single creative person? And there was 10 editors there. When I got a pregnant pause, it was the, it was the answer I knew. That was a pretty amazing weekend to be honest with you, and nothing's been the same since. That day after we went to Marvel and DC was literally the official launch. That was in December of 1991. That was the official launch of, uh, of Image Comic Book. People always told us that our images were, were what we're selling the book. Our images were different, our images. There was a TV commercial and a tennis player, Andre Agassi, looks at the camera and he goes, Image is everything. And Rob goes, that's it. That's the name of the company.
Everything that everybody has ever worked for is in this Image Comics. And if you guys fuck this up and go back to Marvel with your tail between your legs, you are gonna blow it for everyone for a generation. Our first official Image meeting is all of us sitting in a room, looking at each other, going, okay, we've all jumped off the cliff. What are we doing? Okay, we've just turned the industry over. Uh, well, let's just kind of run the industry the way that we want to. The kind of company that we would like to work for. In devising that company for them, they actually created what I think is the best entertainment company that's ever been created. We had two rules that we all agreed on at the very first meeting. Image would never own anything except the image name and the image eye. The reasoning behind that was in case of divorce, there was less to fight about. The second thing was that each individual person would be autonomous and we would never get in one another's way. And early on, we all decided that each partner was going to be their own entity. Even though it was called Image Comics, it was actually six separate companies all unified under the Image banner. Everybody can make their own decisions and everybody must make their own decisions. And it's up to you to just, just take it and go. The contract is unique in that you own everything. The deal's not different depending on the stature of the individual. That's kind of amazing and remarkable and completely unprecedented. So anybody who does a book for Image is really gambling on themselves. And that's kind of cool. That's what we did. But Image Comic Books is, is my chance to change the system. And if the system gets changed even a little bit, and uh, some of the rules get changed, and, and, and it makes it a little bit better for the 12-year-old kids coming up, then we've accomplished what we wanted. What Jim pitched to me was Mark Todd, Rob, himself, all the guys were going to be creating brand new characters and they would own 100% of those characters. It had never happened before. No one had ever left their top positions and then gone on to do books that were similar. And so each one of us was supposed to come with the idea of what book we wanted to do. Cyberforce and Wildcats and Youngblood kind of all were safe because we were known for the X-Men already. So, you know, they were kind of just, they were similar. I knew I had a rapport with the fans. I knew what they liked. And I just wanted to give them more of it. And I was going to do an X-Force-ish style team. Youngblood is the cult of celebrity meeting the cult of violence. A government-run super team that has become the number one entertainment in the world. Wildcats came from the brain of Brandon Choi and Jim Lee, and that was something that they had worked on as kids. So if you look at a lot of these characters, a lot of them came from our childhoods or what we were creating before we became pros. And I'm going to talk about my new book coming out called Wildcats, Covert Action Teams. Uh, it debuts in late July, early August. Uh, hopefully I'll get it done in time. Jim Valentino pitched out Shadowhawk, this guy who goes around breaking spines. <laughs> okay, that's justice for you. Eric Larson, to me, had sort of the clearest message. I just want to do comic books, and I just want to have fun doing comic books. When Eric Larson was a child, he had developed a Savage Dragon character. This is the Savage Dragon, and he is my comic book character. And he is a police officer for the Chicago police. And by God, it's the greatest thing you've ever seen in your life. I had this character that I wanted to do a comic book and had started doing my own comic book when I was 16, 17 called Spawn. It's more like the visual, like just very evil, edgy looking. Ex-military killer who made the deal with the devil to save his family and in exchange would be the devil's avatar on Earth. We definitely had an edge to those creative meetings, you know, and definitely there was a feeling that, okay, um, there's a new wave coming that people aren't quite expecting. When the big announcement happened, uh, all hell broke loose. It was a nuclear bomb. This is CNN. Marvel Entertainment fell three and a quarter today, closing at 49 and a half. We became enemy number one in the comics industry. It might have been the only thing that could have united Marvel and DC was those guys!
kind of looking at the history of comics now as an adult, I kind of really get behind those guys because they took a huge shot in the dark. There was a lot of hating going on, you know, public hating. Everybody was giving us six months. It was the joke to the point where people would lay odds on like, oh, so how many months? How many issues? Ha ha ha. Some of the guys that hate me right now, there's the, the new symbol of the 90s. Get a close up, because that's going to be on the movie that's coming out, guys. You know, once the excitement of and the adrenaline of getting the company started happened, then he had to wait for the numbers. DC was always number two. Marvel was always number one. What are we going to be? The first book to come out for Image was Youngblood. The day Youngblood came out in 92, I arrive at the Golden Apple and I see the line is out the door, wrapped around the corner and going down the neighborhood. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is working. We knew people would show up, but not in droves. Not, not with every major media news camera coming out, not with celebrities wanting to be a part of this. Every TV network covered the launch of Youngblood uh, from New York to Los Angeles. It was new that the mainstream media was interested in something, but Image was kind of a f phenomenon. Oh, I think it's wonderful. I'm going to let all my family know about it. He's fresh. He's just real fresh, you know. Suddenly I'm on Dennis Miller. Comic book author uh, Rob Liefeld is here. <laughs> At the time, the biggest selling uh, independent comic might have sold like 110 or 120,000 copies. I need to sell 60,000 copies in order to make as much money as I was making doing X-Men for Marvel. And so that was my guess of what, you know, Image would do, that we'd be like 60 to 120,000 copies. Then suddenly, they go, Rob, it, we're, we're almost a half a million. That was way beyond what anybody's expectations were at that point. We all pretty much went, yeah. It's, this is going to work. <laughs> Spawn did the same thing. It came out, sold out. I didn't know anybody, with rare exception, who wasn't utterly on board. Uh, and if you weren't on board, you were probably old. put that finger on that pulse of what the audience wanted, it, we were just very fortunate that it was what we wanted too. They were definitely older than us, but it didn't feel like it. It felt like books by 13-year-old boys for 13-year-old boys. You know, I was like every kid of that generation that was reading comics. It was like the most exciting thing I've ever seen. 11, 12 years old and all these other books I'd been reading had such, such history. This was something I can get in on the ground floor of and I could be there from day one, and that really excited me. They weren't going to work for the man every day. They were going to work for themselves and for their art. Even when they weren't perfect, which they often weren't, frankly, there was this level of energy, this unbridled enthusiasm to them. You know, and everybody was like, image is only gonna last six months. Image is only gonna last six months, but now it's the six months that lasted 20 years. In August of 1992, with six comics, we were the number two publisher. We jumped DC Comics and there's 60 comics they solicited. And that's when people freaked out. You go back in time and you count, it was a matter of days. DC's killing Super. It will be out in November. We broke Batman's back. We killed Superman. If you weren't there, you just don't get an idea. These guys were rock stars. It was like being the Beatles. We didn't call ourselves rock stars. It was put on us. You're rock stars. You're rock stars. You know, there was just a mob of people heading towards the counter at comic book store owner hoping the counter didn't break. And you were basically surrounded by people. I felt like my life was in peril. These were happening, so to speak, you know, most, you know, events. Stores closed because we've got around a thousand people ready for signed copies. Never seen comic creators generate that kind of excitement, and I don't believe I will again. I, I do not believe it's possible. They had this amazing 1992. All the books launched, they all broke sales records. 
I think a lot of the, the outside world looked at us and what we did and thought where we all came in with the same idea of what we wanted the company to be. Really, if you had polled each of us individually, you'd probably get, you know, six or seven very different answers. We went from being purely creative people to, uh-oh, we're now business guys. The challenges of starting a business were uh, no, no business experience. I would put that as number one. People that Rob knew became like the marketing director, the, you know, the, the sales director. Were all guys that Rob went to church with. And they weren't necessarily people that had a lot of experience in comics. And I hear that your sister once said, what do you think you're going to be, grow up to be a comic book artist <laughs> yeah. or something? Yeah, she, she, was, she was pretty skeptical. She, yeah? She, um, oh, she want to tell well, them what work. she does that now? Yeah, now she, she works for me. She um, runs my business <laughs> affairs. This is called so. Sweet Revenge, folks. When they started Image, it was pretty much supposed to be one creator, one book. Rob, all of a sudden, was doing two books. Right after Youngblood, in April, hit the late summer crossovers for DC and Marvel. One was called Bloodlines, and at DC it was New Blood. And I go, could you be more obvious? You're trying to diminish my brand here. If Marvel's gonna start mass producing new characters with similar names, similar concepts, I need to get my stuff out. So then Jim Lee had to do, you know, more books. And then all of a sudden everybody's doing all these books. And so they had to hire people to work for them. There was kind of two camps. There was, there was Eric, there was Jim Valentino, and then there was myself with Spawn. Then there was the other three that was Mark, Rob, and Jim, and they all had their studios. I didn't want to run a company. I wanted to have a clubhouse. And I had a great clubhouse. I'm not sure my company was great. In the beginning, it was me looking for a lot of young, fresh talent, and I still look for a lot of young, fresh talent, because I think it's exciting to take a guy from level A to like, you know, to, to Z and, and watch his, his growth. I was working in uh, a bank, I hated it. It was so annoying. I was like, these guys are young, they look like they're happening, this looks cool. And I just asked them for a job. Met guys at comic stores. Look at my samples, I'd be like, why aren't you working in the business? Oh my gosh, you're hired. He saw you're hired, I just went, really? <laughs> My, my doctor thought application or anything like that. He's like, no. I had read all these great interviews with Rob about Youngblood, and I was super excited about it. And so one day I'm talking to Jim about this, and I'm like, yeah, I was kind of bummed because Youngblood wasn't what I thought it was going to be. And Jim says, tell Rob everything you just told me about Youngblood number one. And so I just told him, you know, what I thought about the book. And at the end of this kind of savage critique of the first issue of Youngblood number one, he says, help me do great books. Come work for me. I'll give you a great salary, you'll edit for me. You can write for me too. The first years at Extreme were amazing. There was a lot of camaraderie. It was a small, small crew. It was like hanging out with a bunch of buddies in the studio who loved to draw. It was the 90s, man, like the loud 90s. And you felt the energy like right off the bat, like something big was gonna happen with this. You come in from nothing and you got a nice paycheck. You get a little crazy. I called them kid gangs, you know, especially Extreme, because Extreme was full of all the like teenagers. Extreme, Extreme! You know, we kind of rolled, you know, like we were badasses, even though we weren't. We had our caps on backwards and we had our little extreme leather jackets. I mean, I was showing up to work early, I was staying late. You know, we were working 12, 14 hour days, hanging out on weekends. There was just this just unbridled enthusiasm in the early days. It did feel like a team or a big family. And you wanted Rob to love what you were doing and happy with you. I just wish I would have enjoyed it more or knew what I had back then. It just did not seem real. Everything just came so easy. Howdy, true believers. This is Jim Lee. We're here in Homage Studios. This is my little office. Uh, this is what we call the pit. It's more of the bullpen area of the studio. In the early days of Image, Jim, Mark, and Wills were all part of Homage Studios. When we started out, just the idea of hiring one employee to me was just like, oh my gosh, like, that's just, I'm just throwing that money away. Like, I'm buying this fax machine. I'm just throwing this money away. Like, there's got to be ways I can do this without anybody, and and it proved to be impossible. Homage, just in its name, brought this sort of prestige. And Jim always has carried himself in a very professional manner. And his guys, they did as well. I mean, the guy would draw at his table, be on the phone and be having a conversation with somebody in person, all at the same time. Uh, Jim had the chops 
for being organized, for being a natural born leader, which he was. Um, and he was a very good uh, teacher. Every once in a while, he would pull us aside and just rip us apart. He would take how we would draw heads. He would like, don't draw heads like that. And he would just cut you up. That's the one thing that helped me build as an artist. He really led by example. When it was needed, he did the work that he needed to be done. And then when there was time to kind of blow off steam, he was one of the first ones to get us out. And I know for a lot of the artists I hired, they didn't go to college, a lot of them, and, and I would say this was kind of their college experience. That studio environment really makes things special. Just the camaraderie that develops when people are in the same space, working creatively together. It was desire to put image on the map to the extent that it wouldn't be seen as a momentary blip or an experiment just to, just to experiment, that it would actually be a viable publishing company. I think the way they saw it was that they were kind of like opening the door and they were hoping that there was going to be like this flood of other writers and artists coming along with them. We weren't expecting the resistance that we got from the creative community. A lot of people were actually afraid to jump on the, the uh, image ship. We gave people a platform that they would not have otherwise had. But we did manage to get a few guys that even though they weren't partners, you know, they wanted to come in and publish their books under the image banner. We were all knocking on doors trying to get good guys aboard. They found these guys who were going in new directions and they found these guys who were just not gonna be seen any other way. Sam Keith with the Max. Just generally gave me a call and said, do you want to do this? And I was one of the people willing to leave Marvel and risk no work. <laughs> I had Alan Moore, who hadn't done any comics in, in several years. All the star power that was previously assigned to corporations was taken away from the corporation and put on the name of the person behind the actual comic. For the first time, the biggest selling comics were creator-owned comics, and the uh, creators were reaping the benefits of that in a massive fashion. Ninety three, ninety four, especially, it was the uh, you can't fail era. No matter how bad you do, no matter how late you are, no matter how, you know, just the sales would go up no matter what you did. It was bizarre. I mean, literally anything that we published would outsell anything other publishers were doing. I mean, we did absolutely everything you could to fuck shit up. We published books late. We put out books with the wrong covers on it. We put out things with the wrong price points on it. But there was just this general excitement and enthusiasm about the product and about what we were doing that it was forgiven. But I think that it caught up with them you know, caught up with all of us very quickly. They were putting out stuff that was, I consider junk, that trillions of people were buying. If someone says, hey, if you give me a great idea and I'll pay you a million dollars for it. Wouldn't you want to put out as many books as you could? Obviously some of those ideas are, were good ideas and some of them weren't so good ideas. For me, the idea of uh, sitting at home and drawing, working by myself really appealed to me. When you run a company or have a company, you've got all these other people. You would get a happy, comfortable group of people who were comfortable working with each other, and then we'd have to bring in more people, colorists, letterers, interns. Top Cow was big and unwieldy, but Wildstorm was like twice our size. You know, ultimately you have to lead this group, and I think that was a challenging thing for me. That was something that probably challenged all the image guys. We were all artists, and we had to kind of convert from that mindset to businesses. In the early days of Image, Mark worked with Jim Lee at Homage Studios, but then Mark spun off into his own studio called Top Cow. He got to Jim's place and 
It was Jim's place, Mark Neen and Mark's place. For us personally as a, as a company and, and me personally as a person within Image Comics, there was a little shift of respect in there maybe. He, as the best artist, had the best young artists. Top Cow and Mark created sort of this high-end art boutique style. Like that slick, sexy, dangerous lifestyle, the Ferrari, the gleamy. And I understand, young man, that you've signed a deal with somebody very powerful in this town of Hollywood. Will you share that with us? Uh, I met with uh, Steven Spielberg over at Amblin, and he's going to make a comic book of one of, he's going to make a movie, I'm sorry, out of one of the comic books that we're doing. Image started to delay their releases, and more and more books were shipping late. In the early years, we were a little erratic, a matter of fact, a lot erratic with some of our printing schedules. Um, we were erratic with some of our business decisions. So once these guys became businessmen, you know, they had to split their time up, and, and that's always a big challenge. They were all going to a lot of Hollywood meetings. <laughs> they were all rich, and they kind of forgot to write their books. Todd would get us all in a room, and he'd walk in a circle. Retailers are calling me going, how come Image can't get their shit together? Why's Jim late? Why's Valentino late? Why's Rob late? Why's Mark late? Why's Eric late? All toddies holding the ship up. And I'm like, wow. Like, he, he would like scold us. We would get a Todd scold. And what he was saying was all true. He was on time and we weren't. I think that to some extent amongst the seven of us that started Image, I learned the language of business a little bit better than some of my partners. Todd is a very smart, cunning, clever individual. He sat back on top of his hill and he watched and saw the perils of having a facility, uh, having to be administration to several books. When these books first started, everyone was sort of writing and drawing their own thing. And soon they had people filling in for them and it's just, you, you can't substitute for the real thing. In the mid-90s, Todd pulled back from regular comic book penciling and he hasn't returned since. Drawing comics is a bitch. It is difficult. I think he felt like he had conquered sequential art and decided that he wanted to do uh, other things. Mattel wanted to do some kind of crazy toy deal. It was millions of dollars. And from Todd's perspective, he was like, well, they're willing to pay me this much. I wonder how much I could make if I just manufacture these things. In the dark, Todd made his toy company and tell any of us until he had toys. McFarland Toys revolutionized the industry and it was just really above and beyond even what the best guys were doing at that point. Todd was involved in every bit of the creative process of every toy. He was involved in the design, he was involved in the sculpting. The pose was completely about telling a story in the most compact and efficient way that you could. Everything had to pass over his desk first because his name was gonna be on it. The negative of that is that every time I'm sitting in a meeting talking to business guys is an hour I'm not sitting at a board drawing. And given that my entire corporation was created from the ideas that came from my brain, every now and then I have to turn to my people and go, you guys are going to have to give me more time to be the creative guy, because that's where it all came from. Todd loves comics. I toys, I like I said, business. Out of the original seven Image founders, Eric Larson was the only one to continue penciling his launch title for years and years and years. My life didn't actually change a huge amount. I didn't go out and buy a fancy new sports car because I can also see this may not last forever. I remember Rob buying a, a, a beautiful red Viper and they had just come out. And one of the guys who dressed up as Bad Rock, who got in the Bad Rock costume, and he crashed the car. And Rob is just like, no problem. Most people would go crazy, but there's nothing to these guys.
It's easy to run a business and be successful when the business that you're in is taking off, you know. Uh, in the 90s, there was a huge comics boom. It was surging to a level that really hadn't been seen probably since the 50s. Sales were so good at a certain point, and a lot of people built their lives around them. When it started declining, it created some shock. Nobody thought it would end. I, I really don't think anybody thought that would end, which is odd, because why would you want it to? It's just too much, too much money. If everybody's sort of honest, there was a big speculator sort of market back then. Speculators had crashed the trading card market, and then they all came over into the comics market. They come out one month, and then the next month they're selling for 75 bucks. The value of the comic could double within the first week. You know, there'd been hot comics before, but nothing like this. People thought that they were going to get rich off of hoarding cases of whatever the new number one was. I hope this comic book sign one day will be worth a lot of money and great for <laughs> college education. And now they've got, you know, lining for their birdcage. That bubble was going to burst. It was inevitable. The question was, how big of a pop was it going to be? You know, was it going to be a slow deflation of that bubble? Or was it just going to explode? I remember walking in to the studio like two in the morning and Rob was sitting there all dejected and I was like, oh man, what's going on? Like, what happened? He goes, we, we, we got some bad news. We've, we've had our first book fall under 300,000 copies. A lot of people scrambled, a lot of businesses went under. Um, there was a lot of collateral damage when that market fell down. In the same way that when we started, we didn't know if the sky was the limit, we didn't know what the ground floor was going to be. People were getting laid off. The atmosphere in the studio was, was very tense. With Rob, you could tell his demeanor changed. There was some grumbling of people weren't getting paid. And one of the reasons why we were able to get talent not to go to Marvel and DC was that we were throwing out enormous amounts of cash to creators. Rob, what was the number one best thing about the Extreme Studios days? Oh man, that's tough. The uh, money. <laughs> 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 the pay. I hooked people up. What do we need to pay this guy to get him? You know, do we need to buy Stephen Platt a car in order to get him to off from Moon Knight to come over to do profit? I mean, Rob bought him a car. Part of it was I didn't want no. I didn't want to ever hear no. I remember getting my first royalty check. It was a five-figure check. And I remember showing Danny Mickey, and he fell out of his chair. I'm like, dude, look at this. I was driving a brand new Bronco, a new Corvette. I had a Harley motorcycle. I mean, that's normal for a 25-year-old. But I became a target because I got way too much too soon. I, I, I knew it at the time. I was embarrassed by it. It's one of the reasons I tried to surround myself with other young people who are overpaid. He reminded people that he gave them a lot of money. There was one time he looked down and he said, see all those cars? I bought those cars. None of us were ready for that experience. We didn't have the talent to back it up. And those kids were so young and they were so full of passion and so off the system. It's like nobody was in charge. Everybody's saying yes to you. Everybody said yes to Rob. We went so fast from best-selling creator to, oh my gosh, I have 66 employees. Probably the most complaints about Image Comics at, at any one point were directed towards Rob and towards his line of books. Person X would come in my door and say, hey, Rob, you know, I'm just, I, I'm not, I'm not getting enough work, and could you, could you give me some more pages? And man, I would take on his burden. And so I'd walk around to the inventory room, and I'd pull through the drawers, and I'd pull pages, and I'd go, add these to your tally. I remember Rob standing there and just going, oh my God, I employ all these guys here. And I could, I saw in his face, it was just very overwhelming. I was daddy to a bunch of children at 25. I wasn't prepared for that, and I didn't, like it, there was about a year I worked at home and I didn't come in. I was like, Eric, I'm not coming in. I can't, I can't deal with all this stuff. It's too much.
image did have its moments where it wasn't so cohesive, <laughs> meaning all the time. Uh, it was always a fight. Ask anyone if it's a good idea to have seven partners. Show me a partnership of seven people that has survived. It doesn't for a reason. Image Comics have been doing really well, and Marvel Comics executives at the time were saying, well, why are we doing so badly? And they had to be told, well, it's because these guys have left. Well, how do we get them back? We have to pay them an awful lot of money. We left Marvel, and they chased us back with millions of dollars. And Jim Lee and I had just been paid $3 million each, and we were relaunching Captain America, Avengers, Fantastic Four, and Iron Man. It was completely insane. Marvel was outsourcing their top titles to image partners. You form a company to get away from the man, and then you work for the man, so. That upset the group. At times we would butt heads in sort of the theology of what we were doing. I think Todd really wanted to crush Marvel. Like, Todd had a hate on for Marvel. I mean, he hated them with a passion. That summer, on an image panel with all of us, a couple people stood up and wanted to ask Jim and I about Heroes Reborn, about the Marvel deal. Todd grabbed that mic. You want to ask them about Marvel books? You go to a Marvel panel. We're here to talk image comics only. I find it actually to be a conflict of interest. How can you be the vice president of image comic books and do work for a direct competitor? In other occupations, that's actually illegal by law. And we would say, whatever problems that we seem to have, whenever we were all together, things seemed better. It was when we broke up and went back to our different caves that all the drama and the tension started up. At first, Image was the brand, and everything was rainbows and sunshine. But with breakout successes, delineation started to happen. The guys who are in college and they're in fraternities, and, and they're constantly like going at one another, that, that's what extreme Wildstorm and Top Cow were like back then. So they were starting to put their studio logos on the cover of the book. And they were starting with all this studio identity that was different from their previous image identity. You have to remember that you had seven creators that struck out on their own. Um, you're gonna have seven egos, and you're gonna have to stroke those seven egos. My job is like being the coach on an all-star basketball team where every player is also an owner. Every player believes that they're entitled to the ball. Every play. Those guys were insanely competitive with each other. They were all trying to one-up each other all the time. They spied on each other. They stole each other's ideas. You can't talk to Extreme. You can't let them know how we color the books. What's the other studio doing? You know, it's like, yeah, why are you calling my guy? Anytime they recognize somebody was doing well, they're like, we need, we need that person here. And they were having to deal with the fact that other businesses might want their artists, and it happened to be the guy that they'd been working with. Top Cow was, was really known for developing new talent. Where I had two good pencilers, he had four. At the time, the hottest artist in comics was Michael Turner, and he worked for Top Cow. I was with Rob when we were trying to hire away Mike Turner. I had pretty much had it up to here with getting calls uh, directly to my office from Extreme wanting to talk to my people. And Mark got on the phone. Do you know who this is? And he goes, uh, no. Now this is Mark motherfucking Silvestri. Screamed at him, cursed him out. Matt came in white as a ghost. And I got a phone call from Rob saying, I think I might have gone too far with Mark. You know, I can't run my business always having to look over my shoulder. Love you guys, and I hope this doesn't hurt too much, but I'm out. Todd McFarlane once told the editors of Marvel, who were trying to rein me in, don't try to break a buck and bronco. Six years later, I'm sitting across a guy who's trying to break a buck and bronco. I'm like, I don't want anything to do with your business. Please don't have anything to do with my business. Rob had changed. Rob was a different person. He wasn't this sweet kid anymore. He was powerhouse, just like Todd. He had started up competing a comic book company that he was running at the same time. Mm -hmm. 
I needed to have a label that wasn't subjugated to their influence. And that really upset everybody. They're like, why would you compete with us? Why wouldn't you just put those under the image banner? And it just seemed at a certain point that he wasn't really doing us any favors and that, it, it, that the relationship really should be terminated. It was a very difficult time for me personally. Rob was, was a very dear friend. We had a meeting that summer and they tried to tell me I had to bring everything from Maximum Press into Image Comics, and I said, That's not, that will never happen. First thing that came over was a very well-worded letter from Eric Larson. The, the key thing I remember from Eric's fax was saying, you know, Rob, when you did stuff like this when you were younger, you know, everyone thought it was kind of cute because you were a kid, but we're all older, older now, and, and, and we're kind of sick of it. The rest of us kind of talked about it. It was like, okay, well, if if it's a choice between uh, Rob and Mark. Eric Larson was like, well, I'd rather publish Mark Silvestri's books than yours. I'm like, well, that's great. Then go get Mark Silvestri. I don't know how it looked from the outside, but from the inside, it was like, yeah, guys, this isn't helping. Why, why are we doing this? Called them all up, say, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave. Todd wouldn't take my call. So then they said they were having a formal meeting to vote me out. Waiting till the appropriate time when we could we could take our vote, and Rob faxed in his resignation. I don't think it was easy for anybody, um, but but it was done. He resigned, but he resigned much in the way that Richard Nixon resigned. It's like the writing was on the wall. But my favorite was when Jim Lee came up to me, and he goes, "You won." I said, what did I want you to use? All the magazine covers say you left. Not, not a single one of them says you were fired. You left. I'm like, that's because I left. I don't think any of those guys would characterize it this way, but I, I think there were a lot of hurt feelings and uh, uh, just a lot of bitterness between them at that point. Fortunately, my time away from Image was not long. I spoke with Todd on the phone, and you know, I told him what I needed to come back, and certain assurances and the ways that Image was going to work at that point. And he said, "Okay, let's make that happen." And I came back. And when the market uh, bottomed out. That's when we kind of reality kind of sit in. And, and supporting the studio uh, and making sure that jobs were being retained, that the bills were being paid, I think it was taking its toll. So I called Jim and I said, I hear you're selling to DC. And he categorically denied it. You know, Jim was the key because he was the golden boy of comics. What would happen if we lost Jim? And then about two weeks later, he called me at home and he said, I need to apologize to you because I did lie to you. What else was I supposed to do? It's true, I am selling. We were just gobsmacked. I mean, that was like, nobody saw that one coming. To the public, Jim Lee selling his company Wildstorm to DC Comics felt like a major step backwards for creators' rights. I remember having conversations with him even in the early days of Image and all the pandemonium that was around it, uh, he always had this dream of, at that time, he wanted to run Marvel Comics. You know, he wanted to be editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics. In a way, Image still worked for him. And I think he got really kind of what he wanted. Yeah, I remember him telling me, if you play small, you're gonna win small. If 
you play big, you're gonna win big. I've seen Jim do those deals. I've seen the excitement and power in his face when he does that. You know, and I've seen the power and excitement when he does comics, but it, it doesn't match to when he makes a great deal. Rob and Jim had published the majority of titles at Image Comics, so when they left, there wasn't much remaining at the company. The remaining partners were worried of what we were going to do. It was a tarnished image. Um, definitely, I, I think the bloom was off the rose. The cracks have shown, and maybe this is all going to completely fall apart. Um, but that didn't happen either. We're still in this together, we're still brothers. Let's fix a few things, and we're not gonna let a downward spiraling market you know, defeat us. In 1999, Jim Valentino became publisher of Image, and he brought in more independent voices to try to fill the gap from the departure of Jim and Rob. For me, the sensibility was to broaden the scope as much as humanly possible, and not rely on any specific genre or anything like that, but just good books by good creators. You know, they opened the door, basically, is, is, is really what, what changed everything, is, is they let more people in the room. It allowed us to then capture a couple of really cool, eclectic books, and, and at that point, one of them that we grabbed is Walking Dead. DC and Marvel become more corporate much more corporate. But I just came from a convention where the biggest thing on the floor was an image product called The Walking Dead from a kid who grew up loving our Image Comics. You know, Robert Kirkman is the child of Image Comics. I used to have dreams when I was like 14 that I was like at an image meeting talking to those guys. Robert just loved Image. His whole thing was, when I was a kid, I got into Image Comics and all I wanted to do is uh, create my own comics. I went into comics wanting to be Eric Larson. So my whole idea was, you know, I want to write and draw something uh, myself and be able to do it for years and years and years. Early on, he had done his own character called Battle Pope that he was self-publishing and he had asked if he could use Savage Dragon in there and I said, sure, whatever. You know, he's a comic book guy and uh, he's a passionate guy. But short of killing anybody, I would probably do pretty much anything uh, when I was starting out, uh, you know, just to make things happen, because it is a tough business to kind of get into. He had volunteered to give me a ride to the airport, and that was a huge fiasco, because he had no idea where he was going or how to get there. And he started talking about, oh, and plus I, I've, you know, I've got this zombie comic I want to do. Uh, when I pitched The Walking Dead originally, uh, it was turned down. Uh, simply because there had never been a successful zombie book in the history of comics. Valentino uh, came back and said, you know what, stop pitching us zombie comics. Zombie comics aren't successful and every zombie movie is exactly the same. So we really need something that's going to have a hook, something that, that really makes it different. You know, I wasn't willing to accept no for an answer. He says, you got to tell me what i got to do to get Valentino on my side. And I said, well, I think he told you what you've got to do. You've got to give him a hook. And so I said, oh, well, I forgot to tell you that this is actually a big setup for an alien invasion. The zombies have been created by the aliens because there's this alien race that wants to take over Earth and they want to wipe out humanity first, so they're doing it with the zombie virus. Over the course of the zombie part of the story, I'm gonna be laying all of these hints so that when people go back and read it, they'll say, oh man, he did this here and here and here, and I didn't even see it. So I go into the office the next day and I tell Valentino this, and he's like, like well, okay, you know, as far as I knew, that hadn't ever been done, you know, and I kind of, if he would have told me what it was really about, I would have said, dude, that's great, that's, but he didn't, so, you know, at first I was really reluctant to do it. Uh, and so they accepted the book uh, based on that. And then uh, once the book came out, I remember uh, Eric Stevenson called me up and said, you know, this is awesome. I, I said, I, I gotta hand it to you. You've got me reading a zombie comic. One, one thing that has bothered me through all three of these issues is I don't see any of like the Easter eggs for the alien invasion in here. And Robert just starts laughing maniacally and says, there's no alien invasion. 
I made that up just to get you guys to do the book. You said you wanted a hook. You wanted something different. Well, there you go. That's your different thing. And it's not in there. So yeah, I kind of tricked them into accepting The Walking Dead. The Walking Dead didn't sell well when it was first launched. Uh, I think we did about 7,000 copies for our first issue. Our second issue dropped somewhat significantly. We dropped down to like 5,000. And so I was pretty much convinced that the book was gonna be over by like issue six. And then orders for the third issue came in higher than the second issue. And then orders for the fourth issue came in higher. And it just got to this thing where we would get orders each month and they were up and up and up. We've seen it I go from doing okay sales to just gangbusters. Sales had consistently you know, gone up uh, issue after issue uh, pretty much to this day. I went to my local comic book store in, in London, in Camden, and walked in and said, uh, have you heard about this, uh, this comic book called The Walking Dead? And he said, this is the single most successful comic book we, we've had in the last 10 years. And then obviously you get the complete blowout here where he finally sells it into Hollywood, they put it on TV, and it's now this literally global phenomenon. It's now top viewed TV show on cable television, you know, and it's spawned a media empire. It's brought so many more readers to the book. It's as, it's as simple as that. For a creator to be the point of contact, not the publishing company, not the people that own the publishing company, that's the game changer. So the quality of the Walking Dead TV series has a lot to do with the care and love that Robert Kirkman has put into it. Without his twisted imagination, we wouldn't be here today. And so to have him as an executive producer and writer and in the writer's room is phenomenal. I'm casting the coolest fucking television show on the planet and it's he created it, so I love him. Being able to walk a red carpet at a Walking Dead premiere, pretty cool and, and kind of strange, but you know, this doesn't compare at all to the very first time I talked to Eric Larson on the phone. Oh my God. I mean, I'm kind of freaked out right now. Back him up! Yeah. Prior to Walking Dead, I ran into creative people, and they said the same thing. Well, we can never replicate what you did, Todd, because that was just a different time and place, and it's not the same. And it was really the excuse they used as to why they could never go do their own independent comic book, and it had to be a slave to Marvel and DC. More so now than the founders, Robert Kirkman is the glowing example of what can happen if you choose to basically do it on your own. Whereas some guys did some of their creator own stuff, but then they were kind of seduced away uh, by Marvel. Robert stuck with us. The way that the comic industry should work is that uh, you start out in low selling creator own stuff that you do on your own, or low selling books that you eventually graduate up to Marvel from doing, or DC. And you work your way up through that. And when you hit a certain level where you can sell a book on your own, you leave. Stop writing for fucking Marvel and DC, and you will succeed. You know, I decided to kind of publicly say, I'm leaving this system. I am only going to be doing creator-owned work from now on. He quit the competition. Cold turkey. I thought we had an obligation to go, wow, time to add a partner. Robert Kirkman has taken what we kind of scratched the surface on and has blown it up. So having Kirkman on board as kind of the image cheerleader, the, the kind of poster boy for image success in this generation of creators, I think is a huge boon to image. It used to be that a lot of incoming creators, their biggest aspiration was to draw Spider-Man or the X-Men or Batman. And I think there is a generation of creators coming in and do wanna just do creator own stuff. You have gigantic name creators like Grant Morrison, or Ed Brubaker, or Steve Niles, or all these guys are jumping ship to Image. They're not giving their best to Marvel or DC. It's become the HBO of comics in the sense that people can take their, their long-running franchise ideas to, to Image and, and get them published. We were working on all the big titles for the big established publishers when we decided that we really wanted to start doing our own thing, writing our own uh, material, and be, being kind of the captains of our own destiny a little bit. Uh, Image was the place to go. Absolutely. The former editor from Extreme Studios, Eric Stevenson, is now the publisher of Image Comics. Eric has seen 
every single up and down through image. He's probably the one guy every single founder will listen to. I really appreciate his philosophy on comics in general and on the direction that he wants to take the company in. So we're constantly in a state of renewal. It's You can look at what we're doing this year and it is not the same as what we were doing last year. It is not the same as what we were doing the year before. Image is ahead of the curve of what you're going to eventually probably see in film and television. In all media, the trend is towards content creators having more control over the distribution of the work that they do. There's always been a human drive to take control of one's life. And these guys, in their own odd way, did it. And they did it very successfully, and they are a model to all of us. When I became a partner, uh, Rob Liefeld had not been a partner for a few years. Robert Kirkman wanted mommy and daddy to speak again. He would bring up from time to time, you guys need to get Youngblood back. There were three other publishers that were wanting Youngblood. And the idea of Youngblood not having an image eye on it didn't sit well with me, like just as a fan. And he said, don't do that, please don't do that. Would you come to Image, I said, when the pigs fly? He kind of opened talks between Rob and myself and the other Image partners. Because I knew everybody, I kind of did the legwork of saying, you know, would you guys be okay with Rob coming back and doing Youngblood at Image? And the reaction was unanimously positive. As a fan, it was just an amazing experience for me to be able to get Eric Larson and Rob Liefeld together in a room. And you kind of realize how they did sort of become a family when the company was formed and almost immediately slipped back into that mode and, you know, been pretty tight since. My biggest goal long range for images is, is simple, that it just never goes away. That the day I die, there's an image comic book. Even if there's only one comic book that it publishes, and it's called Spawn, I know that I can attain the goal, because I will never strip that eye off my book, never. I think the art form, the business is better off having more options for the creative community. It gave me an opportunity to create a vehicle whereby I could help other people. And I wanted to be able to continue to do the book that I want to do as long as I was able to do it. So in that regard, it has worked out very well. Even to this day, I, I, I still feel that every time coming up with a new idea. Every time I see something new coming from Top Cow, I still feel that same feeling I had 20 years ago when it was first started. And I will 20 years from now. Something I really wasn't expecting to last that long. Um, but yeah, I still feel like a kid. I just love knowing these guys. I mean, these are the image guys are special guys. We we did. We locked arms. We went up against everybody. I don't think people actually stop and think about what a huge impact this one idea had on you know the entire rest of the industry. There was like this ripple effect that's still going on today. You know, I have a very good career and I have a very good life. You know, I wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't for these guys uh, sitting at this table here. If they hadn't decided to take those risks and start this company when they did, um, you know, those options may not have been available for me. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been benefiting a great deal from all of their hard work. And uh, I know I've thanked them before, but I'll do it again. You, you guys are the best. So. And to our beautiful fans, we love you! Stop, dude.